Aloha, my siblings in Christ. Today we're going to continue our walk together through the letter of James. We're going to look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. I think as we walk through these verses of this letter, you'll see why James, uh, why this letter has been so threatening through the centuries particularly to those with wealth and power and those who oppress. You'll see why it's been considered radical. But first, as is our custom, let us pray. Grant, O God, that following the example of your servant James the Just, brother of our Lord, your church may give itself continually to prayer and to reconciliation of all who are at variance and enmity. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us to hear, hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given to us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now please, sit back and listen chapter 2, verses 1 through 13 of the letter of James. My sisters and brothers, when you show favoritism, you deny the faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has been resurrected in glory. Imagine two people coming into your meeting. One has a gold ring and fine clothes, while the other is poor and dressed in filthy rags. And then suppose that you were to take special notice of the one wearing fine clothes, saying, here is an excellent place, sit here. Uh, but to the poor person, you say, stand over there, or sit at my feet. Wouldn't you have shown favoritism among yourselves and become evil-minded judges? My brothers and sisters, listen. Hasn't God chosen those who are poor by worldly standards to be rich in terms of faith? Hasn't God chosen the poor as the heirs of the kingdom he has promised to those who love him? Uh, but you have dishonored the poor. Now, don't the wealthy make life difficult for you? Aren't they the ones who drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who insult the good names spoken over you at your baptism? You do well when you really fulfill the royal law found in the scripture. Love your neighbor as yourself. But when you show favoritism, you are committing a sin. And by that same law, you are exposed as a lawbreaker. Anyone who tries to keep all the law but fails at one point is guilty of failing to keep all of it. The one who said, don't commit adultery, also said, don't commit murder. If you don't commit adultery, but do commit murder, you are a lawbreaker. In every way then, speak and act as people who will be judged by the law of freedom. There will be no mercy and judgment for anyone who hasn't shown mercy. Mercy overrules judgment.
I think you can see that this is a pretty radical statement. James returns to a theme that we heard earlier in the letter, a theme about wealth and charity. In chapter 1, the th the, the, he actually warns the wealthy. Those who are wealthy should find satisfaction in their low status because they will die off like wildflowers. The sun rises with its scorching heat and dries up the grass so that its flowers fall and its beauty is lost, just like that. In the midst of their daily lives, the wealthy will waste away. And remember the call to be generous? It was in chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift, every perfect gift comes from above. These gifts come down from the Father, the creator of the heavenly lights, in whose character there is no change at all. Now, now here in this part of the letter, though, James is speaking to a specific community at a specific time. But the lesson is for us, the Christ believers in this age. When he, when he writes, My brothers and sisters, when you show favoritism, you deny the faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has been resurrected in glory. James assumes the poor have a very important place in the life of the church. Being rich doesn't give you pride of place or a bigger say. I think you might even take it further. Being in a church a long time doesn't give you pride of place or a bigger say. Or in our churches, being a lifelong Episcopalian doesn't give you pride of place or a bigger say. Coming from the family who gave the window or the bowl in which children are baptized doesn't give you a pride of place or a bigger say. No, it's about faithfulness. So, so take note, he's talking to a, a living, breathing community of Christ believers. He doesn't use the term Ecclesia Church, but he's talking to the church. He's talking to you and to me. Now, this is still early in the life of those Christ believers, those followers. But he's explaining that if you have a relationship with God through Jesus, who is the Messiah, there's a consequence to your behavior. Your faith changes what you do because it's changed who you are. And he makes note that the resurrection is a manifestation of God's glory. The language here, it, it, points, it points away. The Lord Jesus provides the hope for the future that will be coming. And then he tells a story. You have to wonder, had he heard something? Was this more than a story for those first hearers? Uh, he tells the story. Imagine two people come in. Now, you, you heard it. Now, now, one of them is really dressed fine. Big gold ring on his finger. Fancy clothes. And you say to him, Go, come here. This is a really good place to sit. You can hear what's going on. You can see what's happening. And someone else comes in poor, filthy clothes, one might even imagine a bit of a smell, he said, why don't you go stand over there? Or, or here, you, you can have a place, there's a little room on the floor right here by my feet, just, just, just come, just be, be, be quiet. 
Now it says meeting. Now the, 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 the meeting, the word used for meeting here is a common first century Jewish word for meeting. It's not ecclesia, which is also used in some parts of the Jewish community, but was used particularly by the church that became the word church, ecclesia. But no, this is meeting. So, so you can imagine we may be talking about that gathering of believers before there was a building, maybe house church. But these were God's people and they were together. And these strangers, now they're clearly strangers, maybe they're new convert, converts, or maybe, maybe they're somebody you're trying to get into the church. Maybe they've been invited by a friend. Maybe they just heard the stories. But, but you've got to understand, the rejection of that poor, smelly person and the telling of the rich person to sit down, yeah, maybe that's human nature. It, it might have been that the community were afraid of those poor folk. More likely, the community was made up of those poor, poor people. And can you imagine a rich person showed up? Maybe he'll pay for dinner next week. So the followers of Jesus, we as Christ believers, we who believe that the kingdom of God is breaking in upon us and there is a new world coming, we have to reject our unconscious hierarchies. We reject the conventional. And that can be frightening, I know. And James uses more of legal language here. He's trying to, to wouldn't you, won't you show favoritism among yourselves You've become evil-minded judges. Uh, favoritism, the word, the, the Greek word, can also be partiality. You're an unjust judge by showing favoritism, partiality to the rich person and ignoring the poor person. How dare you judge on outward appearance? James, I don't, I, you're yelling at me now, James. Come on. But you've, you've struck a chord. And then James does yell at the folk in writing. My dear brothers and sisters, listen. It's, it's a harsh imperative. Listen. And, and then he says a few questions to them, and I think he expects the hearers to agree, which probably tells us something about that community. Hasn't God chosen the poor by worldly standards to be rich in terms of faith? Hasn't God chosen the poor as the heirs of the kingdom? Wow. Faith and worldly success have nothing to do with each other. There's no prosperity gospel. There's no promise of material wealth coming from James or, I think, from the lips of Jesus. Those are false prophets, false teachers. No, God has chosen the poor because of their faith. He's not going to reward the poor with wealth because of their faith. For James, the time is coming. The time for judgment. So if you say you believe, change the way you act. He's even said, you all dishonor the poor. Wow. And as I was reading this again, it reminded me, it may not have even been conscious. 
I don't know about you, but I sometimes don't see the poor. I don't even see them. My eyes are blind. My ears are stopped. But then James describes the world of the wealthy. Don't the wealthy make life hard for you? Don't they drag you into court? Don't they insult you and make fun of your faith? Don't they deride you for your baptism? Now, clearly, clearly, James thinks the, those who hear this letter will go, oh, yeah, you know those rich people. They're the ones that caused me trouble. They have the money to go to court and sue me. Yeah, they talk stink about me. So it reminds me that most of those gathered, most of those Christ believers, they are the poor. They are the rejected. Ah, but even the poor and the rejected can be fooled by the wealthy who come into the room. Ah. Oppression is internalized. All right, you see why James, why this letter, <laughs> they didn't like it in Central America when the liberation theologians read it out loud. So he then goes, however, into the great commandment. We're, we're right back to Matthew. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul, and you will love your neighbors as yourself. Or as James writes in, in verse 8, you do well when you really fulfill the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. I, I love that, the royal law. This is the final one. This is the only way anyone's going to tell whether we're the followers of Jesus or not. When you show favoritism, he writes, you are committing a sin. Wow. He went right to it then, didn't he? You're sinning. And the law, the royal law, the great commandment, shows you to be a lawbreaker. Now, you know, you know that James had in the back of his mind the sayings of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. Remember Matthew 5, 19? Therefore, whoever ignores one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called the lowest in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps these commands and teaches people to keep them will be called the greatest. And even uses the same phrasing that James did. In verse 11 of chapter 5, the one who said don't commit adultery also said don't commit murder. So James, the commission of adultery and murder, gets connected to the great, to the um, Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 21, 22. Ah, uh, you see, the author, he's taking what he knows. But more importantly, what God's people know. And he's saying to them, now, now you know this. This is your faith. We know the sayings of Jesus. Uh, some of us heard them personally. Then why have you forgotten? Why do you show favoritism? Why don't you welcome the humble? In verse 12, in every way then speak and act as the people who will be judged by the law of freedom. Oh, 
Now you see how he's turned the law upside down? It's not a barrier, it's not a bond upon you. The law, the royal law, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself, actually gives you freedom, gives me freedom. I'm free from my prejudices if I live into the law. The law of freedom breaks down the hierarchies of community and of time. And then, then he ends, reminding me of again of 1 Peter. Remember, I've said before, James and 1 Peter are a lot alike. If you have the Gospel of Matthew, the letter of James and 1 Peter, you're going to see some commonality. Remember in 1 Peter 2.10, once you were no people, now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Here, chapter 2, verse 13. James writes, there will be no mercy in judgment for anyone who hasn't shown mercy. Mercy overrules judgment. Mercy. Remember, mercy is that free act of love of a higher up to someone below them. So showing mercy is showing love when you don't have to. Don't have to by the measure of the world, by the standards of the world. Showing mercy is giving freely of love without expecting anything in return. Happy are people who show mercy because they will receive mercy. Remember, back to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 7. So James is holding each of us account, to account. Each of us, you and me, about how we treat others, but most importantly, how we truly invite and welcome others into our faith community, into our gathering, as the people of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, In you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit that in all the cares and occupations of our life we may not forget you, but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks be to you, my Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits you have given us, for all the pains and insults you have borne for us. O most merciful Redeemer, friend, and brother, may we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Please know God loves you. Please know that I love you. I will pray for you. Please remember me in your prayers. Aloha.